we sure do know that the world needs mercy. We look around and we see racial divide. We look around, we see religious divide. We look around even in our cities and we see violence, people throwing rocks, uh, people killing each other. It's not a matter of forgiveness. It's a matter of not being paralyzed by the past. The great story of Mother Teresa going out with nothing and uh, no followers in the beginning. Many of the people we serve are really the poorest of the poor, the unwanted, the unloved, the abandoned. I want them to know that there's hope. It's never too late to change. You know, doing God's will in your life doesn't mean you're gonna be free from pain, doesn't mean you're gonna be free from you know, discomfort or suffering, but it means that at the end of the day, you're doing the right thing for the right reasons. I want them to go home knowing that their best days are still in front of them, that, uh, that God is good, that He is for them, that they haven't made too many mistakes. Good evening, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and to people of all faiths. I hope this next half hour both inspires and encourages you. We begin tonight with a look at 2016, declared by Pope Francis as the year of mercy for Catholics. I sat down with New York's Cardinal Dolan for what that means for Catholics and non-Catholics alike. Hi. Hi. Thanks Good for coming. See you. One of the most powerful religious leaders in New York City, Timothy Cardinal Dolan, the Archbishop of New York, sat down with me at his residence to talk about sin and second chances. There's no sin that is unforgivable. What does the year of mercy mean? I guess Pope Francis is worried that a lot of people have this caricature of God of being mean, angry, vengeful, uh, petty. Uh, that's anything but the truth. God has told us, I am rich in mercy. Pope Francis grew up just outside Buenos Aires. Biographers say he discovered his vocation to the priesthood after going to confession as a boy when a priest took mercy on him. He's a man on a mission. There's a sense of urgency about Pope Francis. You might see him. He's hyperkinetic. He doesn't let up. He's 79 years old. He's got some health problems, uh, not major, thanks be to God. And he said openly, I don't think my pontificate's going to be that long. So, boy, he wants to seize the moment. Why did the Pope pick 2016 as the year of mercy? He knows that the church itself needs mercy. The church is hurting. Uh, the church has been scarred by scandal, by sin, by people leaving. So does the year of mercy forgive for what you've already done? Or yeah. does it forgive in this year? Pope Francis would use this year of mercy to remind us of a constant in church teaching, namely that there's no sin that is unforgivable, that all God wants to hear us say is, I'm sorry. What can non-Catholics take away from Pope Francis's year of mercy? Even if you're not a believer out there in the world, you need to know that the human person is at his or her best when he or she acts with mercy and tenderness. What can uh, they be forgiven sure. for? We need personally mercy. We need God to say, thanks for owning up to things. I love you, I forgive you, and I'm going to help you do better. So when Pope Francis speaks about mercy, it's a give and take. We get it, we give it. He wants us to be merciful to others. Forgiveness and mercy, when we receive it, it brings out the best in us. <laughs> We sure do know that the world needs mercy. We look around and we see racial divide. We look around, we see religious divide. We look around even in our cities and we see violence, people throwing rocks, uh, people killing each other. Mercy is not a bad idea for all of us. I think Pope Francis is popular because he could care less about being popular. <laughs> Does that make any sense? He simply is who he is. There's a simplicity and a sincerity about him. 2016 is also the year Mother Teresa became Saint Teresa. I talk with the sisters who belong to the Order of Nuns Mother Teresa founded. They are carrying on her legacy all over the world, including right here in the South Bronx. These Catholic nuns belong to the Missionaries of Charity, a religious order founded by Mother Teresa. The sisters are devoted to fulfilling Mother Teresa's mission. Many of the people we serve are really the poorest of the poor, the unwanted, the unloved, the abandoned. And when we show that they are somebody to us, that we love them, and we, we touch them, we smile at them with love, 
they know that they're special, that they are loved. Mother Teresa visited this home she opened in the South Bronx many times. It's one of 750 she started around the world. Mother Teresa! The last time she came here was right before her death. On that trip, she met Princess Diana. When she'd come for mass, we'd invite our volunteers, people we know, the poor whom we serve. There'd be a big crowd. And of course, it was because she was here, it would be packed. And she said to me, sister, what's happening? Are you having a special celebration today that all these people are here? But it was for her, you know, her presence here. So she was very humble. Each day, the sisters rise before dawn, pray, and then feed, on average, 100 needy people in the soup kitchen here. Some come from the men's shelter. They also operate above the kitchen in the South Bronx. All the time, these sisters keeping in mind Mother Teresa's words. When we give food, it's not just giving food, but the way we give it, that we show that they have a dignity. You're welcome. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, as she's best known, was beatified or blessed by Pope John Paul II, the first step toward becoming a saint. Pope Francis took the second step and will elevate her to sainthood. Her canonization comes almost 20 years after she died. Miracles that have been attributed to her intercession since her death, it, the church has determined that yes, she is in heaven and she will be called Saint Therese of Calcutta. Sister Claire met Mother Teresa when she was just 18 and first taking her vows of chastity, poverty, obedience, and wholeheartedly helping the poor. I was so excited. At what a gift to, to have Mother being a saint now because we had been wondering, when is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? The great story of Mother Teresa going out with nothing and uh, no followers in the beginning and beginning this work to go work with the poorest of the poor. Father Donald Haggerty traveled to India with Mother Teresa. This is a picture of the simple room in Calcutta she lived in when she wasn't traveling. Though Mother Teresa will soon become Saint Teresa, she will always be mother to her sisters. She promised she will be with us more and help us more when she's in heaven. Rabbi Arthur Schneier is one of New York's most respected rabbis. His family died in the Holocaust, a turning point in his life, and someone who's learned over time that forgiveness does not mean forgetting. The sky was total darkness. With uh, my family uh, deported to Auschwitz, I have, if I want to visit the uh, cemetery, I can only go to the crematory of Auschwitz. Uh, that's where the ashes may May, I may discover. I experienced man's inhumanity uh, in Vienna 1938 when um, the, the Nazis took over. I saw my synagogue uh, set on fire. He and his mother came to the United States in 1947. I'm very, very proud of the fact that uh, I came to this country of freedom uh, where I was able not only to rebuild myself but to be of service and pay back uh, for having survived and preside over a wonderful community and a magnificent sanctuary. I believe in building and not destruction. How do you keep your faith? So some, first of all, it's something very personal. Many of the uh, Holocaust survivors uh, turn against God and turn against man. And they say, how did God permit this to happen? Well, the question is, God, where were you? I said, you know, God, you saved me. You saved me. I'm grateful, and I'm going to be grateful for the rest of my life. It wasn't God who perpetrated these crimes. It was man. How is it you were able to forgive, or, or have you? Uh, it's not a matter of forgiveness. It's a matter of not being paralyzed by the past. Next, a man who knows all about forgiveness. I had the chance to realign my life to live my life, God willing, based on the precepts that I hold important, and to begin again. My exclusive interview with former New Jersey Governor Jim McGreevy, and later. We are so glad that you chose to. Behind the scenes with one of the most popular pastors in the world.
Now to a story about second chances. Former New Jersey Governor Jim McGreevy lost power but found faith. And now he spends his time helping others get a new start. My truth is that I am a gay American. I New Jersey Governor Jim McGreevy's stunning resignation 12 years ago catapulted him into the national spotlight. I engaged in an adult consensual affair with another man. I think that was the start of my journey. I think that's the start of the authentic journey. That's the start of, of what was real. Minutes before facing the press to reveal his secret, he says he mustered courage by praying. And I remember walking into the bathroom and holding on to that scapula and looking into the mirror. And I, and I just said, Grandma, it's like, here it is. I'm being truthful and I'm being honest and I'm doing what God would want me to do. And I was just praying to her and through her. You know, you think in life of, of profound turns. That was, that was one of them because it was to lead life openly and transparently and honestly and without any secrets. For what title would you like us to use these days? Oh, Jim, Jim McGreevy. I sat down with the former governor of New Jersey, oh, now right. just Jim, at Martin's Place in Jersey City. It's one of several prisoner reentry programs he runs around the state. Redemption and a second chance is something McGreevy feels he got after leaving office. I had the chance to realign my life, to live my life, God willing, based on the precepts that I hold important and to begin again. So that was a powerful gift. My God at that time sadly was politics and myself. Now he finds ex-cons, jobs, housing, and most importantly, inspiration. We're going to talk about a, a mentor program. That's what we need. Most of the men and women he helps have no idea the man they call Jim used to be the most powerful leader in New Jersey. Tanya's yeah, come great. from jail to now she's going to have her own apartment, school, and job. Mm -hmm. Arthur served 30 want. months in prison. But if we can't get that second chance, that's why we go back to the life of crime, because that's the only thing we knew. Gone are the perks and the power of the governor's office. But as McGreevy puts it, also gone are the lies. How does that feel? Oh, you know, doing God's will in your life doesn't mean you're going to be free from pain, doesn't mean you're going to be free from, you know, discomfort or suffering, but it means that at the end of the day, you're doing the right thing for the right reasons and it's going to be okay. As you heard, the former governor, Jim McGreevy, believes in second chances. So with all this work that he's doing here in Jersey City, I had to ask him if he's ever tempted to go back into public life. Everybody wants to know if you would consider running for office again. <laughs> Are you sure? Are I'm you positive. ever tempted to oh, run tempted. for office? I have temptation. People say, well, you should run for office and whatever. And I realize in my heart, that's not healthy for me. You know, I've been there. That's not because then that's about me with ego again, right? It's about me. It's not about service to the community. Being here, working with our clients, being grounded, keeps me very much in a place of service. I'm much more comfortable with who and what I am now. Coming up, finding faith in your relationships. Too often we want to go from introduction to intimacy and we end up with a wreck before we even get started. My candid conversation with A.R. Bernard. A.R. Bernard is a businessman turned author and now spiritual leader. He pastors at a popular church in Brooklyn and sat down with me about finding faith in relationships. If you go into a relationship looking for what you're going to get, there's a term for that. It's called lust. And you've got to know the difference between love and lust. Period. We believe it, we proclaim it, and we're seeing it come to pass. Pastor A.R. Bernard knows something about making relationships work. He founded the Christian Cultural Center in Brooklyn, growing a small Bible study group into a church with 33,000 members. Powerful politicians and celebrities often turn to him for spiritual guidance. Married 44 years, he has also spent decades counseling couples. What is the most common mistake couples make? Too often we want to go from introduction to intimacy and we end up 
with a wreck before we even get started. He offers a four-word formula for success. Maturity, decisiveness, consistency, and strength. Those are four things that women want in they men. They want that. They don't want an immature man. They don't want an indecisive man. They don't want an inconsistent man. And they don't want a weak man. Another key to a lasting relationship, forgiveness. I don't forgive because I feel it or don't feel it. I forgive because I make a conscious decision to release you from any debt that you have because of the hurt that you caused me. What if you've lost faith in relationships? Talk to the single people out there that have just given up. Bitterness, hurt can lock you in to a place where you are just so disillusioned and discouraged about the future that you live in apprehension instead of anticipation. The good news? Pastor Bernard says you still have time to make things right. I want them to know that there's hope. It's never too late to change. And this book is filled with tried and proven principles that work. It works. We are so glad that you chose to. Coming up, Joel Osteen one on one. Did you ever expect this kind of a following? A rare look at what goes into his Sunday sermons seen by millions. He's one of the most famous televangelists in the country. Joel Osteen speaks to millions around the world every Sunday. So I decided to pay him a visit at one of his mega concerts. We are so glad that you chose to spend your Resurrection Sunday with us here at Lakewood. And did you ever expect this kind of a following? I never did. What do you attribute it to? I don't know. I don't know what it is. I think part of it is my parents for 40 years, they, they you know, served there in the church and built a great foundation. But some of it's just, some of it's just the sovereignty of God. I mean, I couldn't have made it happen. On this night in Newark, New Jersey, the Prudential Center has been transformed into a mega church. Lights, cameras, and a Christian rock band warm up the 14,000 faithful. The crowd is waiting eagerly for famed Texas televangelist Joel Osteen. I've seen him before and I think he's wonderful and I'm really looking forward to seeing him. What do you very like happy. about him? Um, very uplifting. Backstage, Osteen and I have a rare few quiet moments before he starts the three hour service that resembles a Broadway production. Are there any rituals you're doing right now to get yourself mentally and spiritually prepared? I'm not an entertainer, I'm not a performer, I'm just a, you know, I'm a pastor. Osteen at 53 has 4 million Twitter followers and is easily one of the most well-known pastors in America. He broadcasts from the Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas each Sunday, reaching more than 100 million homes in the U.S. and millions more in 100 countries around the world. God's going to make things happen faster than you thought. Maybe it should take you 10 more years to get in management. One touch of God's favor can put you there. Get you won't hear devil and damnation or fire and brimstone in this ministry. The popular pastor is known for preaching the so-called gospel of positivity. Maybe things aren't going my way, but I believe today could be my day. I believe something is up in front of me. Doing your part, then I believe that's when God can begin to open doors. On this stop in Newark, on the Night of Hope tour, it's a family affair. Wife Victoria often joins Joel on stage. I believe that God doesn't want us to go through life struggling all the time. His two children sing with the band. What can people do who are without hope? You may have a lot wrong in your life, but do you have your health? Do you have a, a place to live? If you find something to be grateful, I believe that a grateful heart you know, discouragement can't stay in a grateful heart. If you're ready to celebrate a risen Savior today. You know, even if you're not religious, just again, letting it be a time of new beginnings. It's a packed house here in Newark and an enthusiastic one. They tell me they want to hear a message of hope. Sometimes I turn on the TV and then what I'm going through, that's what he's preaching about. So it's just amazing. Well, you always feel better when you leave, no matter how many problems you have. You go home feeling tomorrow's going to be better. I want them to go home knowing that their best days are still in front of them, that, uh, that God is good, that He is for them, that they haven't made too many mistakes, that, uh, you know, that there's something bright in their future. A message resonating with the audience on this night in Newark, New Jersey. 
I hope this half hour inspired you to find a little faith. Until next time, I'm Sharon Crowley.